morning, everyone. It's 11.30 and we are starting our webinar. Uh, this is Ekaterina Stoops, e-learning faculty development coordinator. And welcome everyone to our uh, webinar series, CSI CDU. And CSI stands for Connect, Share and Inspire. Uh, this webinar series is designed to connect us with our colleagues and share best practices and hopefully inspire to adopt some new teaching strategies and techniques in our classrooms. So this is a third webinar and the topic today is effective feedback, getting your point across. Before we begin uh, our webinar, I would like to go over some house rules. So this is going to be an interactive webinar and our presenter, Alan Cruz, who I will introduce in a minute, will be sharing her strategies um, for providing effective feedback to students. Uh, if you have any questions while Alan is presenting, please use chat and tap your questions there. Also, during the webinar, you will have plenty of opportunities to discuss and share your ideas. And uh, when the time comes to participate in this interactive activities, we would like to ask you to use your microphones and cameras so we can have a dynamic discussion. But when you're not speaking, please keep your mics muted so we're not getting any background noise. If you have any technical issues while we are progressing through the webinar, you can use chat to let us know about the issue you are experiencing. Um, or if you lose connectivity and collaborate, uh, you can always email us at bbsupport at cdu.edu. We are monitoring our emails and we'll help you get back to collaborate. And now I would like to introduce our presenter, Dr. Alan Caruz. Dr. Alan Caruz is a professor and program director for, for the Masters of Arts in Counseling at City University. In addition to program administration, Dr. Cruz is an award-winning instructor. For example, the, Ameri uh, the American Mental Health Counselors Association awarded Dr. Cruz the Linda Seligman Counselor Educator of the Year Award for 2013 and 14. And in 2014, the Western Association for Council Education and Supervision awarded Dr. Cruz the Outstanding Council Educator Award. Alan has been a faculty member at CDU since 2011 and a program director since January 2016. Alan teaches a number of courses, including lifespan development, internship supervision, and consulate theories. Before coming to CDU, Alan spent over 15 years working in human services and community mental health. Alan is a licensed mental health counselor in Washington State, a national certified counselor, and an approved clinical supervisor. And without further ado, Alan, please take it away. Thanks, E. Katrina. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm excited to have you all here with us today. This series is the first time that I've had the opportunity um, to facilitate a webinar, so I appreciate your patience and flexibility as we move along. What I'd like to do is talk briefly about my experiences providing feedback and briefly share with everyone some ideas from the research literature about best practices in providing feedback. And basically, I see this as an opportunity to have a conversation in, uh, about this aspect of teaching. So before we get started, I'm wondering what you all consider to be the goals of providing effective feedback. You can either raise your hands or type in the chat, chat box if anyone has any ideas about goals. Thanks. Carla says encouraging students to do better and showing them how to improve. Thanks, Carla. Any other ideas about, about how, what goals you keep in mind when providing feedback? Facilitate learning something new, Svetlana says. Great. Thanks so much. So we're going to talk about all of those things as we move forward here. 
And basically, in my experience, providing meaningful feedback in a way that students can hear the feedback is a critical aspect of student development. In the MAC program here at City U, we're tasked with helping students meet professional standards in different ways. Training counselors requires us to provide feedback both academically and interpersonally. Um, I believe that one thing I've learned from this is the importance of establishing a climate of safety for students so that they'll be able to, one, hear the feedback that I give, and then, two, incorporate the feedback into their academic work or their, or their interpersonal style. We don't really have enough time to discuss creating safety in the classroom, but I do want to stress that I believe this to be an important part of the feedback process. Oh, and there's Mike offering another goal. Mike says learning when enough feedback is enough and when it's too much. Great, Mike. Thanks. Okay, so I realize we're coming from dis different disciplines, but one of the tasks that we have in common is providing feedback, particularly on academic writing. And since we shared this particular activity, I thought we could use it as our platform for discussing effective feedback. So to start, I'll share a bit of a few pieces I found regarding best practices, and then we'll practice with a couple of examples. I've included a hyperlink at the bottom of this page, and we will also send you a hyperlink to an article on effective feedback in the journal Educational Leadership. In this piece, the author discussed seven essentials to providing effective feedback. First, effective feedback is designed with a learning goal in mind. Whenever I begin the process of providing feedback to students on their academic writing, one of the first things that we talk about is the ways in which learning APA style will help them in clinical practice. A lot of times I get some eye rolls when I say that, but then we'll discuss the importance of clear and concise communication in academic writing, and we'll share with them how clear and concise writing is a critical part of their documentation practices as a mental health counselor. I often use the example of the first time that I had to write an affidavit that revoked a person's civil liberties because this person had become a danger to themselves. While this is an extreme example, students recognize the correlation regarding the importance of clear communication. With this in mind, I then tell my students that I consider it my job to help them move from wherever they are to from wherever they are now to the point of readiness to enter the profession and that the best way I've found to do that is to see the process of feedback as a conversation. I tell my students in their first paper that my pen will be light, so to speak, because we're only at the beginning of the conversation and it's important for me to just have a good idea of where to begin. This initial conversation sets the stage for students that feedback is intended to help them move toward the professional standard that they'll need to demonstrate. One of the other aspects of effective feedback that the author discussed and that I find to be important is the timeliness of the feedback that I provide. In general, I work very hard to provide feedback before students will have to submit their next assignment. This sometimes proves difficult when I'm providing feedback on weekly discussions, but is usually feasible for larger assignments. Most of the classes in the MAC program include a couple of papers, so I'm usually very intentional about providing feedback on the first paper well in advance of when students would need to submit their second paper. The author of this piece also discussed the importance of actionable feedback, stating that effective feedback is concrete, specific, and useful. Phrases like, good job, are nice and supportive, but they don't necessarily help students know what specifically they can do more or less of in the future. Feedback about what students do well is just as important as feedback about where students could improve. Another point the author makes about effective feedback is that it's ongoing. I agree here. Like I mentioned in my own work, I found that if I can approach the act of providing feedback as entering into a conversation with students, then it seems the students have the space to be open to the back and forth or ongoing nature of providing feedback. I also appreciated the reminders that this author offered about what feedback is not. Particularly, feedback is neither advice nor evaluation. Again, good work is certainly supportive, but it doesn't necessarily move the conversation forward since it's not actionable or goal-oriented. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, moving forward. See, I mentioned earlier that I begin the process of providing feedback on academic writing by illustrating how clear and concise writing written documentation is an important professional skill. 
I'll talk with my students about how critical it can be to really interrogate their words in session notes and that we have opportunity to practice that same behavior in academic writing. This might not be the same scenario you found yourself in with establishing goals of providing a feedback, but here are a few general goals in addition to what we talked about earlier that I find important to keep in mind. First, helping students understand what they did well and then help them understand what specifically they can do to make the next assignment better. Also, show students the rationale for their grade. In the MAC program, the rubrics that we use typically provide that rationale. Then in my written comments, I'll highlight what things students are doing well in addition to helping students understand what they can do to improve their work before the next assignment. Whoops, sorry. There we go. Um, on slide seven, I've included five tips from a second source that I found to be helpful. This information is coming from the Edutopia website, and we'll send you this hyperlink also in that email that we send out. Similarly to the article from Educational Leadership, tips for providing effective feedback include the importance of being specific, being timely, and being goal-oriented. Also, this author mentions the need to present feedback carefully and to involve students in the feedback process. In the first session of this webinar, one of the participants shared that she follows the STAR acronym, S-T-A-R. In this model, feedback should be specific, timely, actionable, and respectful. I'm curious if any of you have other examples or strategies that you'd like to share. We'll have some time here in a few minutes to talk about that, but you can maybe jot those things down for yourself. I like the notion of respectful in the STAR example. I find that, that the notion of presenting feedback carefully is quite important. Like I mentioned earlier, establishing a safe environment, in my opinion, is a key to student learning. There's a difference between just telling students what they should be doing and helping students understand how to make changes that will help them meet their long-term goals. Also, involving students in the process of feedback is a key in helping students develop awareness of their learning. If students can view learning as a process rather than as a series of evaluations, then students have the space to recognize their mistakes and develop their own strategies for addressing weaker places. Okay, so that's my spiel. To summarize, we've got a manageable list of tips that we can take away from here. First, feedback should be specific. Second, feedback should be goal-oriented. Third, feedback should be respectful and sensitive to the learner's needs or presented carefully. And finally, feedback should involve the student in the process. What I'd like to do next is to present an example of student writing from a student in the MAC program and then discuss how we could accomplish providing feedback on this example based on this list of tips. So to begin, we'll look at an example together as a large group and then we'll have an opportunity to practice in smaller groups with a different example. So here's an example of an abstract written by a Mac student. In, this, in our program, one of the common errors is that students mistakenly believe that an abstract serves as an introduction to their paper rather than as a summary of their paper. Here you can see that the student's instructions for writing the abstract are to, number one, write a concise summary of the key points in the review of literature, and number two, include possible implications of your review of literature for professional practice. So this student, based on those instructions, this student wrote, this paper examines the connections between early childhood attachment and adult attachment. Early childhood attachment is reviewed as the basis of attachment theory. Recent research studying the relationship between childhood and adult attachment is reviewed, particularly related to the peer-slash-romantic relationship tradition of attachment research. Considerations with regard to culture, gender, and sexual orientation in relation to attachment are discussed, as well as implications of attachment for the counseling field. So you can see that in this example, the student has a good basic understanding of the purpose of an abstract, and the student has a clear writing style also. I'd like to work through the example as a large group, and then we'll have the opportunity to practice on the second example, like I mentioned. Here I've included four questions that, I, that we can use to guide the feedback that we give, and I'll give an example of how I might respond to each of the questions in the feedback that I provide for the student. So for the first question, 
which is how would you be specific? I might say to the student, I appreciate the clear language that you've used to describe specifically what the reader can expect in the manuscript. You've told the reader what the main focus of the paper is, how you will frame the discussion through a theory, what contemporary researchers are discussing in this area, and that the reader can expect to see professional implications of this work. So basically just putting back to the student what they did well with the assignment. From there, the next question, because I've been in a conversation with student with the student prior to the submission of this work, I might pick up where I left off with previous feedback in, in my answer to the second question, which is how would you ensure that your feedback helps this learner reach writing goals? For example, if this student had not demonstrated competence in previous work, then I might praise the student for incorporating feedback from prior assignments into this assignment. I might say something along the lines of, I see here that you were able to follow the general guidelines for what is to be included in an abstract. Thanks for your efforts in incorporating my previous feedback. I think the point here is that students will recognize that the instructor is aware of their overall development and is invested in the process with them. For the third question, here we go. How would you be sensitive to the learner's needs? I think that instructors will have to be aware of who students are and where they are in their learning process. In addition to my previous comment, I might say something along the lines of, I know you mentioned after class that you had trouble with APA style before and that the feedback on writing in third person was helpful. You've demonstrated that here in a clear way. And then for the last question, how would you involve the learner in the feedback? I believe it's important to be aware of who students are and where they are in their learning process, like I mentioned. And I might finish my above comment with a statement, your flexibility and responsiveness to my feedback on your writing is a disposition that I believe will serve you well as you continue in the program and in your clinical work. So just acknowledging the student's efforts. Um, and I have, I think that after asking each of those questions, I can have a meaningful piece of feedback that highlights what students have done well and maintains a focus on the student's learning goals. So now our e-learning folks are going to help us split off into breakout rooms to practice with another example. Before we do that though, I'm curious if anyone has any questions or comments that they'd like to add. All right, everybody's doing okay then. So just like we did in the example together, um, I'd like for the groups, let's see, how many are we up to? We got about 11 participants. So why don't we have one group of six and one group of five? I'd like to have the groups discuss each of the four questions based on the second example, and you'll have that slide available to you while you're working. Go ahead and assume that this is the first piece of writing that you've reviewed from this student. Like I did in answering each of the four questions in the first example, one person from each group should volunteer to write down the group's responses so that you can share your suggested feedback with the large group. Keep in mind the instructions for this abstract are to write a concise summary of the key points in the review of LIT and to include possible implications of the review for professional practice. Like I mentioned, your job is to provide a brief paragraph that includes all of your feedback that you could share back with the larger group. Uh, and I think Whitney is maybe going to help us get broken up into our into our groups. Ellen. Yes. Uh, before we break into our groups, we did have one question from Cindy. Um, how do you keep track of individual students' progress when you have many, many students? Thanks, Cindy. That's a great question. I think one of the things I do for myself is that if if I'm working with a particular cohort, then I'm going to keep files in my own documents of, of student work and hold on to those files so that whenever I have the students, say I have them in one class and then they come back to me in another class, I'll still have that feedback that I gave them from the first class and just kind of hold on to that and keep it in mind while I'm uh, reading their work in the second class. So I think it probably just depends on your own practices as far as how you um, manage student work and hold on to files and things like that. Does anybody else have ideas about that? Um, I could say that uh, in the classes that I've taught, a lot of times I'll make um, 
it's kind of how I organize my files. So I'll have a file for each course that I'm teaching. And then within that file, I have a, a folder for each student. And then I can keep all of their work in one place. So as I'm evaluating new work that they're um, submitting in the course, I can go back and reference um, past work that they've done. Uh, I think any introductory assignments are also really helpful in kind of getting a feel for who students are uh, before you actually start getting uh, assignments from them or work from them. Great. Thanks, Erin. Any other ideas about that? Good question, Cindy. Thanks. Okay, so wait, here's Carla. Carla does the same thing. She keeps a file for every course and one for every student inside the file for the course. So yeah, I think it's organizational strategies seems like would be the way to think about how to track the feedback that you give. Great, thanks. Okay, so back to Whitney and getting us split up into groups. This will be fun and exciting. So I'm going to turn it over to Whitney. All right, um, you're going to have about 10 minutes to talk in your groups, and I'm going to put you in. Um, in just a minute, you'll see the screen kind of go black, and it'll say you're moving to group one or group two. Once you're in the group, uh, turn on your microphone, and if you want to, your uh, video as well. There is going to be a moderator in each of the rooms that will um, be uploading a uh, the case study, the second case study for you to look at. So the moderator will kind of go over what you should be starting to do, picking out someone to write down um, the answers and that sort of thing. Um, but then once that's up, you can go ahead, talk about it, write down your feedback, and then I will give you a two-minute warning before we pull back into the main room. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask the moderator in your group. So without further ado, here we go. I hope that that was somewhat uh, useful for everybody. Um, and I know we probably could continue to talk about this particular paragraph for quite a while. It's got lots and lots in it to consider as far as giving feedback. But I'm curious about what each of the groups came up with. Maybe you finished and came up with a complete paragraph. Maybe you were uh, busy talking about particular questions. Um, but I'm curious if we can hear from our um, different groups about what came out conversation. So how about group one? Did someone um, take notes from group one? Yes, I think we were in group one and I did. Um, and we talked about first noticing the students what they did well and noticing that they um, had a well-written thesis statement um, and um, that it is support, very well supported by examples. Um, uh, and, but we also talked about that uh, this uh, piece looks more like an um, introduction and is not exactly following the structure of the abstract. Um, and we might recommend this, the student just to maybe to remind the students about the student about the structure of the abstract that the abstract is the summary of their paper, and this it it is the summary of their paper is missing in this piece, um, and um, so maybe we also talked about if that's the first paper that the student wrote to give them an example of the well written abstract and point out you know the pieces in the abstract. It needs to be some like an introductory sentence, um, maybe from their introduction, and then a few sentences about what they're gonna, what they did in their paper, and that they use some research to support their statements, and few maybe one or two sentences in the end about how they are going to um, implement whatever how that they're writing about, implementing whatever their conclusions are in their. Um, in educational institutions, if we talk about this particular uh, topic. So um, somebody says that two said that two meals a day need to be uh, um, spelled too. Uh, just a minor kind of um, thing. Good catch. 
yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That, Thank that's you, Group One. Basically. Uh huh. Go ahead. Yeah, that's it. Did I cut yeah. you off? Anything else? Sorry. No, no. I think we we just talked about not really being critical of this piece, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. to un understand that this may be the student's first time right. writing the abstract right. and giving them really good feedback on what the abstract is and right. how this should, it should be structured, give them example, mm -hmm. maybe ask them to rewrite and check what they wrote, give them additional mm -hmm. feedback, but do it step by step rather than demanding, you know, the perfect abstract right away. Great. Thank you. That's great. How about group two? What did you guys come up with? Um, I think our ideas were pretty similar to the first group, so I'll just read what um, we ha have written down. So, um, you've done a good job of summarizing your points about nutrition. However, your content is more like an introduction than an abstract. The last three sentences make a good point. Is this the conclusion of your paper, or is it the conclusion of the reviewed literature? In the draft, you did a much better uh, job of specifically addressing the major points rather than saying that you were going to summarize the major points. Um, sentences two to four, um, in, in sentences two to four, rather than going into the details um, to identify, oh, I don't know if I can read my writing here, just like, um, in sentences two to four, rather than going into the details, um, to ident you could identify um, the approaches to implementing nutrition in the schools. Thanks, Carla. That's all great stuff. I really like how both groups are focused on um, highlighting what the student did well. And since we know this is the first piece of writing that we've seen, I think that's a really important place to begin the conversation like we talked about earlier. Any other last comments that we'd like to make? But I know we're looking, how much time do we have over there, Whitney? No time, Whitney says no, no time. time. <laughs> so any other last comments that anyone would like to make? I'll go oh, over to the, have let's see. Yeah. Oh, oh, I see. Cindy asks, since this is a real life example, do you know about the feedback that the student received and how that feedback was received? I do know about the feedback because this was a paper she turned into me. Um, and so basically sort of what you guys are talking about is that I'm going to be really particular about what an abstract is, how it looks, um, usually how many sentences might be included and what those sentences will include. And this particular student is one that has done a really good job of incorporating feedback and working towards the professional standards. So she's she's been able to make significant improvements during her program. Good question. Any other last minute comments, questions? Well, thank you all so much. It was fun and I enjoyed being with you in this format and I'll turn it back over to E. Katrina. Bye. Thank you, Ellen. Um, and I have um, a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, I would like to mention that I will be sending out an evaluation form today. So it is short and it is anonymous. And we would greatly appreciate your feedback and suggestions on how to improve our CSI webinars. I also wanted to announce that we have three more webinars planned for the next quarter and we'll be uh, sending out an email with the registration forms uh, to each webinar uh, very, very soon. But I just wanted to let you know about the three topics that we are planning for the next quarter. So in January, we uh, we will talk about secondary rubrics. And the presenter, uh, Greg Price, will share his examples. He'll talk about why and how to use secondary rubrics in the classroom. So in uh, February, we uh, the topic <clears throat> for the webinar in February will be group uh, group work, teamwork, and how to organize group work and teamwork using Blackboard Blackboard tools. 
and the presenter, uh, Lin Lan, uh, will share her examples on how to um, facilitate group and teamwork assignments using Blackboard tools. And then another webinar in March will focus on uh, creating reusable course content. The presenter will talk about the benefits of reusable content and how to use Blackboard's content system to organize and reuse content. And one more uh, announcement at the end of the quarter of the next quarter, we will have a CDU Faculty Professional Development Conference. The theme for the conference is Te Techniques for Terrific Teaching. It is scheduled for March 28th and will be in the evening. Uh, and now we're accepting uh, the proposals. So the deadline for proposal submissions is December 15th. So if you're interested in presenting for the conference, please submit your proposals by December 15th. So an email was sent out recently, well actually several emails were sent out um, to announce the conference and uh, there, are, there is a link um, to the uh, form where you can submit a proposal. Also this information is uh, Whitney, thank you for sharing this link. And also, this information is posted on our faculty uh, development website. And you can always email me directly if you have any questions about uh, how to submit a proposal about the conference in general or about the webinars. And again, thank you very much for attending this webinar, for your questions, comments, and have a great rest of the day. Bye.